Hi guys, my name is Hazem Osman. I'm 17 years old. I am uh, the Secretary General and Founder of ESKMEN. I've been a secretary in three other MENs. I'm right now enrolled in a program designed for Egypt's youngest entrepreneurs. I received guidance from some of the largest businessmen in Egypt. My personal mentor currently lives and works on Wall Street. Most of my friends look up to me and they often look to me as that super enthusiastic, super charismatic, clear bold, uh, clear, clear bold, and everything's pretty much settled in my life. And that sounds epic. I often like to look at myself and tell my friends I'm the, the definition of success. And they sometimes respond by saying that I might be occasionally egoistic or arrogant. Now my talk is entitled The Curtain Call, and what The Curtain Call is, is when the actors or performers come out after their performance to salute the crowd as themselves. And uh, that's what I'm about to do, so yeah, that was a performance. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, now let's get to the official talk. The topic at hand is something very sensitive, very delicate. That, delicate that most people uh, don't know much about or have uh, misinformation or have been misguided about, and it's depression. Now, trends in media tends to get, tend to give us false information about what we truly have or make us believe that we uh, are victims of things that we're truly not. So the first thing that we have to establish between, uh, about depression, that depression never equals sadness. These are two very, very, very different things. Now, I'm not going to use any big fancy words, so I'm just going to keep it simple. Now, depression watered down is basically something medical, and it's the absence of happy substances in your brain. That's what depression medically is. Which is why depression is something really hard to pinpoint on a psychological level. So, what distinguishes depression from sadness? You see, sadness is very short term and very minuscule in comparison to depression. Sadness might be caused by a single event. Sadness can be. Uh, Sadness can be very short term, it's for example just your favorite team losing and it can be considered very long term. If, for example, you lose someone, someone died or you just lost a loved one or something like that. And depression is accompanied by a full wave of other emotions. It's never just really you being sad. No, it's uh, accompanied by, uh, by anger and obviously sadness and anxiety, confusion, fear. Fear of what you can never truly pinpoint. Um, if you ask anyone who has depression, what if they're afraid? 100% of the time we'll say yes, we'll never truly know what we're afraid of, but we're always afraid of something. We have this sense of helplessness that something is wrong, something is wrong, and that we're afraid of something. And we're all, we always tend to have these uh, bad days, which is when we wake up and we're like, I'm sick of this, I'm sick of that. It just happens. It doesn't mean that people with depression obviously don't have their good days. I mean, we obviously do. I'm, I'm, I'm delivering proof. I'm, I'm, I'm currently giving a TEDx speech, so we have our good days. But depression, it really it, it consumes you. And you have multiple options. You can either try and fight it, which will just put you through a lot of pain, as it has with me, or you can decide to work with it and consume it. So the first thing we have to distinguish is depression and sadness are two very, very different things. To furthermore, explain, I'm going to tell you a story. And I speak mainly from personal experience about everything that I'm going to say right now. During the fourth grade, I uh, traveled to Saudi Arabia, and the first year went Flawlessly. I made new friends, I was, uh, I was very nice to most of the kids, and uh, I was loyal and I had a lot of friends. The problem started during the second half of fifth grade when a new kid came to class. Now this new kid was much larger than myself and he had this uh, sense of self-confidence because his father, who was also my class teacher, my geography teacher, my, and my math teacher, is also our school principal. So he felt that, you know what, he's better than most people. Now obviously he is the new kid, and I've been now in school for one and a half years, so I decided, okay, I'm going to go on, I'm, I'm my kind of altruistic self, I'm going to go on, I'm going to introduce myself, where I'm going to be kind. The problem is, is people tend to abuse kindness a lot. That's exactly what happened to me. I experienced all of this verbal and physical abuse that I never thought I'd experience as, as a child. In fact, I still remember vividly when it got physical, when I would occasionally get pushed into the bushes and I'd come out of it with scarred legs, occasionally bleeding or getting pulled by my shirt to the collar rips, getting pushed around, and after it all, I'd always laugh, because they were laughing. And I didn't want to be a bus, because I thought, you know what, this is acceptable, he's new, he's just trying to become popular, he's trying to make people laugh, and naturally we believe that laughing is something good, so I just said, you know what, if everyone's laughing, then it's perfectly fine, so every single time I was abused, I just looked at smiled and I laughed. I even remember at uh, this one time, when Nobody was around, and uh, I was—I lived in a compound, and I was on my bike, 
I saw him my uncle in the middle of the street, and I looked at him, and I was already uh, thinking which line I'm going to say, or I'm going to greet him with, hey man, what's up, how's it going, whatever would be fitting. And he looked at me, and he smiled, so I expected this is going to go fine. I called next to him on my bike, with uh, no warning at all. He turns around and he kicks me in the stomach. And I'm on my bike. I hold on for dear life in order not to fall over because I knew that I would get hurt and I'd probably cry, which would make me a buzzkill again. And I just looked at him and he laughed. And what did I do? I laughed again. I just laughed it off and I expected it to be something completely normal and acceptable. Fast forward, we're in the sixth grade and I became the most popular kid in class and in the school, in fact, and that was probably the dream of any, any middle schooler. Uh, the problem is I became the most popular kid for all of the wrong reasons. I became the most popular kid because because I was an easy target. I was someone who the entire school could make, pick on for uh, an absolute reason and there would be no consequences because they knew that I was afraid of being that busted, that I was going to be kind about it, that I was just going to laugh at all. When it got worse, and that's when I realized that there was a serious problem, was when that guy, that new kid, he walked up to me. You see, I was, I was a teacher, spent most of the time in class because when I was around the teachers, they couldn't do anything to me. So, he walks up to me, and as I said, his father, he was he obviously taught me a lot. And he was my teacher throughout two subjects. And he was a school principal, so he came up to me one day and he looked me dead in the eye, full of disgust, and he told me, you know what? My father likes you more than me. And that's when I understood that all of the things that happened in the past, they were never really just jokes. There was all abuse simply backed up by true hate. This was a guy who truly believed that his own father, his own flesh and blood, loved a random student more than him. And he wanted retaliation for that, revenge. That's when I realized that there's an actual problem. And that is when I stopped taking it as fun and jokes and realized that this was actual abuse. And it only got worse from that stage. The jokes got worse, I was called names, and names define me, they really do. And I was pushed around more, I was beat more, and my life was generally hell. So by the uh, half of sixth grade, the second semester, one day I came back home, I sat down on my desk, and I pulled out this knife I had. I held it to my throat for two four minutes. During those three minutes, I was only debating why I should still be alive. If I killed myself, on one hand, I would release this burden, I would uh, lift the boulder off of my shoulder. Why shouldn't I do that? What do I have to do for anymore? My life is hell. That day, the only reason I survived, be it some divine force, whatever it may be, I really don't know. But my mother had to have it. When she'd walk through the door of the house, she'd yell my name in order to see if I was home. So that day, she just simply walked through the door, she opened the door, and she yelled my name, like any usual day. And for one second, I felt a sense of reassurance, a sense of hope, that everything is going to be fine no matter what. And I made a conscious choice that day when I put down the knife that, you know what? Even if, I, even if I would die, even if I'm not really sure whether I deserve to live, even if I'm going through hell, that I can never, ever put my parents through the pain of losing a son. My mother is the only reason I at the time of life. She was the only motive behind me putting the knife down that day. And that conscious choice is the reason that I'm standing here today. I went back to school and I was generally more afraid and I decided that maybe I could open up a bit to my mother. So at the beginning I just told her, Mom, I'm afraid of going to school and when it got worse I asked her that, please, I want to go home. But I had to hold out another year and so I did. And uh, I came back to Egypt during the 8th grade. So yeah, and I thought everything was going to be fine. I'm meeting my childhood friends were basically family. They could never do to me what these kids did to me in Saudi Arabia. And uh, never have I been so wrong. You see, in Egypt, we all know how the jokes go getting uh, lightly slapped or tapped on the neck, uh, name calling, and they usually take it for fun. The problem is they never really notice when they've crossed the line. They never know when enough is enough. They fail to recognize that. And they fail to recognize it in my case as well. So from the 8th grade to the end of the 11th grade, I received nothing but constant abuse again. And again, I start contemplating suicide. So, naturally, everything is is bad, it's terrible. And at one point, I had this sense of awakening that, you know what? I have to set out to change. I need to change. I can't remain like this all my entire life. So at one point, I decided, you know what? 
As of today, I'm going to change it. That was at the beginning of grade 12. I looked myself in the mirror and I took the first step, the very first and the easiest step, which if you ever go through something like I have, you should do too. The first step towards solving a problem is recognizing there is one. It's a cliche, but cliches exist for a reason. And it's mainly because they're true. So I looked myself in the mirror that day and I, and I told myself, you know what? You said something is wrong. You have to fix it. You're not fine. These are not jokes. It's not acceptable. It's not funny. You're in fact going through hell again. And that's the first step I took. And now the next steps are way more complicated because recognizing that that's a problem, it's okay. But, and it's great that you took that, that first step. But now you have to actually act upon it. The second step I took is I decided that I would say no. Never be afraid to say no. If someone's doing something that you don't like, tell them. Let, let, your, let your opinion be heard. If you don't want to do something, tell them. We were born free. We, are not, we should not be defined by that vision that others have of us. I shouldn't do what they want me to do simply because I want to appear cool or, or, uh, or popular. I should do what I want to do only. And that is only what matters. So I decided, you know what? I'm not going to care about what anyone else thinks. I'm only going to care about what I think. I'm going to say no when I find no one is relevant. I'm always going to give my true opinion. And mind you, the holiest thing a human possesses is this thing up here. Your mind is the single most holy thing you possess. Without it, all of this is just a shell. This is where the magic happens. And the product of your brain or your mind is basically your opinion. So disregarding your opinion, that, that, that's a scandal. That's like saying I don't recognize that this is the greatest thing I have. So recognize the fact that giving your opinion is in fact something very important, that you have to say no one knows relevant, that you should never lie. Question, how many of you have here ever lied about bad grades? Pretty sure we all have. It's something natural. <laughs> well, that's low. It's something natural that we all do. And imagine how much, for example, you could have avoided if after the exam you just went back home to your mom and you were like, hey, look, I performed badly. The grade is not going to turn out that well. I just want you to be ready. You could have avoided so much. You could have avoided the punishment instead of just Showing up home and you're like, I did great, and then you failed the exam. <clears throat> Sorry. Imagine how much you could avoid it. Lying is never acceptable under any circumstances. Uh, unless, and the guys who understand this, if you, if you have a girlfriend and she looks bad in a dress, then you should probably, yeah, <laughs> you don't understand. So lying is never acceptable. Always tell them to state your true opinion. But after that, well, okay, it's great. Now, uh, now, I recognize that there's a problem, and I set out to solve it. I'm going to say my true opinion, I'm going to recognize that there are problems, I'm going to say them, I'm going to say no. What now? Well, the next step would naturally be set out a goal for who you want to be. Know your limits and capabilities, and build an image of the future to you. I'm pretty sure everyone here knows Muhammad Ali, and he has this one quote, which I believe is absolutely spectacular. He said, I always said I was the greatest before I ever knew even I was. For I ever even knew I was. And he eventually became the greatest. It acts like a magnet. If you choose that person you want to be, and you say, you know what, I'm going to be successful, I'm going to own a, uh, a big business, I'm going to be a millionaire. Now you have to prove it to yourself. Now, now you set that mentality. You set that mentality that you're actually rich and successful. And it works like a magnet on you. There's this one quote I read that helped me a lot when I, was, when I didn't have that much self confidence. It said, if you're not confident enough, fake it and it will come with time. And the same concept works for your life. If you're not the person you want to be, just keep reminding yourself that you are. Give yourself that mentality and you will eventually reach that person. I mean, look at me. From seven years of constant abuse, I decided that, you know what, I'm going to start my own enemy and I'm going to give a TEDx speech and I'm going to tell my crush I like her. I achieved two of those things, I did not tell my crush I like her, but never mind about that. <laughs> So set up, set up that person you want to be. Set your self-image. What I did, what I did, I actually managed to achieve it. Never mind my question. I managed to achieve everything I wanted because I simply set up to be that person. I gave myself that mentality. And the last and final thing, and that is by far the most important thing you have to keep in your mind. Never, ever, ever bottle up. Bottling up is the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. It's the reason why it took me seven years to change. It's the reason why it took me seven years before I decided to speak up. It's the reason why it took me seven years of torment before realizing that something is wrong. Because I refuse to speak up. 
I refuse to meet on bus crew. I refuse to tell anyone my problems. We need a shoulder to cry. Find someone who you can vent to. Am I you crying for guys because I know that this is a very sensitive topic? Crying doesn't make you less of a man. I promise you crying will make you more manly than anyone else. Venting and crying just gives you the sense of freedom, of being released. Because when you bottle up, it doesn't feel good. It feels like you're constricted by something, whereas when you just let it all out, everything is going to be fine. For example, when, when I'm angry, for example, I need to find a way to release my anger. And after that, I'm not angry anymore, whether I go around with a punching bag or whatever I do. The same works when you bottle up. Find that shoulder to cry on. Find someone who can accept you with all of your flaws, all of uh, you can show your soft side to. I know this is a very sensitive topic because not many people like to show their soft side. But see, all of this is just a hard shell. What's on the inside just really matters. I mean, would you have been ever different if you were just inside a different shell? How would you truly look like if there was no shell at all? At all? Find that one person you need to vent to. That one person you can trust. Just the most important thing, you need to find that person. So what do I leave you here today, with today? I leave you first of all recognizing that depression and sadness are two very different things. Your friend might be going through it, and it's okay, you have to be there for him, you have to be that shoulder for him to cry. You have to accept, you have to accept him the way he is, accept his fault. I leave you recognizing that problems do exist. People are often just afraid of showing them, and you have to see what's between the lines. You have to see beyond the show. My talk is entitled Spiritual. And what the curtain call is, is when an actor comes out after performance to salute the crowd as himself. So, uh, to conclude my speech, I'd like to introduce myself to all of you. Hi, my uh, name is Fatma Swan. I'm 17 years old. I have uh, a depression. I contemplate suicide every now and then. Uh, social anxiety. I'm generally afraid of a lot of things. And I was abused for seven straight years. I always bottled up. I lied. I never gave my true opinion, I always gave a fitting answer. But look at what I made in the 